The United Kingdom, known for double-decker buses, love for tea, red phone booths, Big Ben, the royal family, and as the second biggest economy in Europe. Made up of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom is the fifth largest economy in the world by GDP, despite being the 78th biggest country. It is often described as one of the most globalized countries in the world. So globalized that even the origin of one of England's national food, chicken tikka masala, are up for debate. If the world has to thank this region for one thing, that would be what's termed as the Industrial Revolution. From 1759 to 1839, the Industrial Revolution shifted humans from hand production to machines. Although many historians challenge this idea. Nevertheless, that time not only brought major economic progress, but also many social and cultural changes along with it. The century 1815 to 1914 observed an increase of 15-fold textile production, 20-fold coal production, and 30-fold iron production. It would not be wrong to say that this model was copied by other Western nations to advance their societies. Early 20th century, Germany and United States began to dare Britain's economic lead. After the end of World War I in 1918, the British Empire was among the victorious allies, but it had suffered huge economic losses and was no longer the illustrious industrial and military power. After the end of World War II in 1945, British Empire was again among the victorious allies, but their lead as an economic leader had diminished. The Empire of Japan captured its colonies in East Asia and Southeast Asia, the British Empire lost more of its power when the subcontinent achieved its independence and became Pakistan and India. Decolonization was inevitable. While Britain's side of the argument says the colonies, like the subcontinent, was costing them more than the economic benefits they extracted, the opposition of the story has debunked this many times, highlighting all the riches that were exploited. Later, the Suez Canal crisis marked the end of Great Britain's role as the world's prime powers. It was no longer controlling a quarter of the Earth's total area, and it was no longer the empire on which the sun never sets. Following the end of World War II, despite witnessing a somewhat prosperous growth in the 1950s and 1960s, the UK recorded weaker growth compared to other European countries. This stagnation was often arguably blamed on the nationalization of major industries. While other countries like Japan and Germany were focusing on the free market economy with private businesses, the United Kingdom was nationalizing its industries. The inefficiency of these industries and the cost it took to keep them running had a severe impact on the economy. Lack of innovation, overseas competition, low-cost manufacturing by other countries, trade unionism, the welfare state, and the decline of the British Empire were all blamed as possible reasons for this outcome. By the 1970s, they were referred to as the sick man of Europe. In the 80s, they started to change things up by rolling back the nationalization process. Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, the first female prime minister of the United Kingdom, held the office for 11 years from 1979 to 1990. She stated clearly that she came with one deliberate intent, to change Britain from a dependent to a self-reliant society, from a give-it-to-me to a do-it-yourself nation. She set the country on a different path with neoliberal economic policies by privatizing state-owned businesses, mostly the service and industrial sector. The tax cut, trade union reforms and market deregulation were some of the other areas touched by the government. Maggie was probably one of the most polarizing figures in the country's history. For some, everything she did was right, and to others, she was totally wrong. We would love to hear your opinion about Mrs. Thatcher in the comment section below. The privatization, focus on a free market economy, and deregulation did save the country from going into further decline, but it was probably too late by then. By this time, the industries were so behind those of international markets that they were unable to match up in open competition. This limited the British economy to the service-oriented sectors. Thatcher's successes did follow the same economic policies as her, except for inclusion in the European Union, which was, in large part, a despairing move to enforce the country to become more competitive. Whether it was the European Union or the outcomes of the reforms by Margaret Thatcher, it seemed to have worked and the UK saw sustained economic growth from 1993 onwards until 2008. The financial crisis in 2008 brought out all the problems that were less obvious, including productivity. 
It is also highly likely the productivity was already in decline, but it was overstated before the 2008 financial crisis, and it didn't look bad only because the financial sector of the UK was doing considerably great. This went on and ultimately the EU became an easy scapegoat for the politicians and press. With Brexit, which stands for British Exit, the country kept a stiff upper lip and decided to leave the European Union with a referendum in 2016. It stayed one of the most talked about topics in the country, other than always talking about the weather. While many argue with statements like, what do they even produce? Financial services are one of those sectors that don't show up on the books as prominently as McLaren's, but they do bring in a lot of cash. Financial services and insurance is the biggest contributor to the economy and accounts for around three quarters of the total GDP. You can call it a knowledge-based economy. London remains the second biggest financial center in the world after New York City. Edinburgh also holds a high ranking for its financial services industry. Another important service-related sector includes aerospace, which is the second largest aerospace industry in the world. Rolls-Royce is known to the general public for making cars, but they make most of their money manufacturing aviation-related stuff. The country receives the third highest inward foreign direct investment in the world. Foreign investment can boost any country's economy and can be a sizable source of capital. But if these investors send their profits out of the country, it's not so good. The UK seems to be an example of such a country. The United Kingdom has not recorded a positive current account balance since 1985. That means the country is making other countries grow richer at their expense. The UK is among the list of nations ranked the highest on the Ease of Doing Business Index. According to data collected in 2018, 1.1% of businesses operating in the UK were under foreign ownership, but they contributed to over 13% of total UK company assets. Almost a quarter of these foreign-owned corporations are owned from within the United States. Foreign investments not only give a boost to the economy, but it shows global trust in the country. However, the UK itself spends less on investments compared to any other G7 countries. Data on gross fixed capital formation as a percentage of GDP indicates that the UK is behind other countries like Germany and France in investments. There is also a notable difference in economic prosperity among different regions of the UK, with London being the hub and its economy also being the largest per capita in Europe. While the United Kingdom is never generally termed as an oil country, the North Sea oil and gas production contributed significantly to the economy. It's the same oil that funds Norway's trillion dollar fund, but the UK and Norway took a completely different approach with oil. The National Health Service, NHS, not only provides free healthcare across the country, but it also provides jobs, tons of jobs. Back in 2015, it was ranked the fifth largest employer in the world with 1.7 million employees. The pharmaceutical industry of the UK is the 10th largest in the world and contributes significantly to the country's economy. The UK is one of the top weapon exporting countries. The country has also been accused of selling weapons to war-torn regions which have witnessed human rights abuses. The United Kingdom is among the list of top countries with the most number of billionaires, and the wealth inequality rankings are pretty average. 65% of UK consumers are reported to be loyal shoppers, which are higher than the global average of 61%. It's great for the local industry as keeping a connection with the consumers works great compared to short-term sales goals. Over one-third of the consumers, particularly the younger generation, value the brand's ethical behavior before buying. Value-added tax rate is 20% on most goods and services. The country's businesses must include VAT in the price. The British pound is the world's oldest currency still in use, but there is another factor that's possibly the country's biggest but most underrated international asset. That is the English language. The country's economy benefited from the international status of the English language. English has become a lingua franca in international business and relations. This does not include some of their accents and William Shakespeare's way of writing novels. British cuisine is not that advanced compared to Italian and French cuisines, but the British consume 167 million portions of fish and chips every year, making it a 1.2 billion pound food industry. The country has over 10,500 specialist fish and chip shops, which dramatically outnumbers other fast food outlets. The country has a big car industry, offering premium categories to cars for sporting events. 
The UK has some very reputable car brands like Aston Martin, Bentley, Jaguar, Land Rover, Lotus, McLaren, Rolls-Royce, etc. Yes, some of them were sold to other brands from other countries. We won't be getting into the details of how they match up against the German and Italian car brands, but you can let us know in the comment section. The country's economy faced its biggest annual decline in 300 years in 2020 due to the coronavirus pandemic, as the GDP fell by 9.9%. Mostly all sectors felt the impact of lockdown and decline in demand followed by the recovery. On the other hand, the UK's economy received global attention ever since they decided to take a divorce from the European Union in 2016. The nation that says sorry a lot formally said goodbye to the EU on January 31, 2021. Around 48% of UK exports go to the European Union, while around 52% of UK imports come from the European Union. It is still unclear how the departure from the EU would impact UK's economy as it happened amid the pandemic. The nation known for forming orderly queues was divided between the unnecessarily confident leavers and the strongly emotional remainers. Have they shot themselves in the foot or is the European Union a slowly sinking ship? Only time will tell. Brexit will be what the United Kingdom makes of it. It's too late to discuss the objectivity of the decision. It's better to cut the fortune telling and as these guys said, take these broken wings and learn to fly. What do you think of the economic future of the United Kingdom? We would try to reply to everyone in the comment section below. Please like, subscribe and share to support the channel.